Incidental to monumental, from minuscule to massive, but there's always the impulse to remember. Sometimes we remember as a form of catharsis, sometimes it's a means of, of expiating the sins or the, the memories that we have. 71 years since the end of the Second World War, in which 20 million people were killed and 6 million were Jews. The two of us, one secular Jew, one... One of us, <laughs> We could get uh, ...are driven to remember and to attempt to understand the monstrosity what occurred not so long ago. <laughs> you know, over the years, we visited destination memorials. And we thought the destination memorials were important sites, important places to study. We were wrong. We went to Yad Vashem in Israel. And we went to the General Heroes Memorial in Memorial to the Holocaust in Hyde Park. Which no one knows is there. It's hidden by the serpentine. Uh, it's very hard to find. Uh, we tracked the history and the development and ultimately went to the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, right by the Brandenburg Gate. We've gone to the Venetian Ghetto. We've gone to the Judenplatz. We've gone to the National Holocaust Memorial, which is part of the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. We've gone to the New England Holocaust Memorial in Boston. And we've gone to numerous others, a list too long to mention. We've been moved, in a way, in each of these places. But ultimately, we felt the need to distinguish some of these places from others. We felt the need, for example, to distinguish the difference between going to a monument and going to a, or a memorial and going to a museum. And so for our comments tonight, we, while we have things to say, we always have things to say about um, Holocaust museums, comments tonight are really going to focus on um, monuments, memorials, and it's also part because of this part of our work has grown out of uh, the studies that we've done on public space, and many of you know that for many years we've been fascinated by the communicative functions of public spaces. Now, when we go to some of these public spaces and we see various types of commemorations, of memorials, um, we are fascinated by their ability to communicate over time. So the time-binding function of these memorials. And the kind of experience that people have, the um, development of a relationship between a memorial installation of the public space and what people take away, what people experience with regard to that, that installation. So our focus has been on memorial <coughs> in public space. Now, much has been written about memorials in public space. H how many of you have seen images like this? Yeah. It's like, it becomes almost a cliche that 
this kind of an art installation, this or, or memorial, um, is something that you see in many, many places. This happens to be one that was taken in Yad Vashem. It could be taken in many places. And we'll show you a couple of slides that, um, that give you other examples of places where very similar imagery can be found. Uh, but as we looked at these, as, at these places, part of our challenge was to trace uh, the genre of Holocaust commemoration, which has evolved differently from time to time, place to place. To, and what we've really tried to do is to um, describe and practice the writing and the commemoration of this cultural phenomenon. We've asked questions like, how does the medium and the message vary from country from country, to city to city? What's the language of commemoration? What's the architectural discourse? What are the ethical and legal constraints? Where do you get to build? So our approach tonight is to fuse what you and others know about sites like this and our own personal experiences, our own journeys, and how we react to the past and to the effort to remember and properly commemorate the past. How many of you have seen images like this? That look familiar? Well, but there was an artist in Norway who did this earlier, before World War II. I can't remember his name. Who am I talking about? I don't know, but you're going to give me something to Google. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this does look familiar. Mm -hmm. French historian uh, Theodora observed that we live in a historical age that calls out for memory because it has abandoned it. The impulse to remember, to venerate the victims of the Nazi genocide and the effort to honor the heroes or even to define who the heroes would be um, actually began with the survivors themselves. The survivors who bore witness through their oral testimonies and through their memoirs. Now, others erected monuments at sites of atrocities. Um, and so that same image that you saw in Yad Vashem, we've encountered over and over again, as I mentioned. Well, that is outside of Dachau. Um, so we've visited many concentration camps. We would have a good talk when we go to Oh, we'd go on trips, summer trips. People would come back, you know, we'd come back from trips and say, oh, did you have a great, great vacation? It's like, yeah, I spent the vacation going from concentration camp to concentration camp. What a good time. Um, but we, we've gone to many concentration camps, and we've seen this repetitive imagery and repetitive language. Um, we've gone to concentration camps that are often um, not on the hit parade of concentration camps. So this is one. We went from Dachau to uh, France. The one concentration camp in France is uh, Strusshof. And that soaring image that you see in the background is actually one of the earliest installations of a, uh, of a memorial to the Holocaust in France. It was um, dedicated by Charles de Gaulle. Uh, and the, uh, the experience that we had at this camp was actually um, memorable. Um, so we, we, we go to this camp in, in Struthoff, and um, we visit the grave sites, we visit the memorial, and we go into the museum portion, which is this lower building that you see. And it's five minutes before 12, five minutes before noon. And that's very important. And we suddenly hear a loudspeaker blare in rapid fire French, better than my ability to comprehend, uh, some message that seemed to thrust everyone towards the door except us. So eventually we followed, <laughs> you know, it's like we're the last ones out, we followed people out only to learn that, well, it's 5 to 12, and now 
the installation is closing for two hours. After all, it is France, and it's lunchtime. So we're down, we're out in the middle of nowhere, and we say, "All right, where, what are we going to do for two hours?" And one of the guards suggests to us that if we have a car and if we can go quickly, we can get to a um, a site three kilometers away from this concentration camp, where the uh, experiments, where the medical experiments were done, again, chasing fun, um, where we can get to where the medical experiments were done. And they stay open later than the camp stays open. So they close for lunch for two hours. We get in the car. We race over to the, uh, to the other installation. And we find this fascinating. The, the sites where um, it was a guided tour, actually, of uh, several people on a tour of this um, this building where it was a very hot day, the doors were open. Suddenly the doors close. We hear locks. Well, it's 12, it's 12, 25. 12 25. They, they said it would be later. And at 1225, they were giving us a break. And they said, well, listen, we'll continue the tour, but we're going to close the doors. Well, we didn't under quite understand that. Our French wasn't that good. And so we hear the doors, we see the doors closed, we hear the locks, and the last thing I remember was racing to the door and pounding on it to get out. Were you by yourself? No, because the only other person that panicked was you. <laughs> <laughs> and with, uh, without any communication between the two of us, the only other person panicking at the idea of being locked in this installation the other people there seem fine with it. We managed to get out, have lunch, and then go back. But research is fun. Um, so we've gone to many concentration camps. We've gone to cemeteries, cemeteries where victims are buried, and where they're not buried, but they're commemorated. Um, this you've is gone to. Yeah, it's like, you can have a favorite. Uh, this is uh, Père Lachaise in, in Paris. How many of you have been to Père Lachaise? Okay, you probably saw some of these. So there, there are like 12 of these, uh, and basically what they are is um, graves where there are no, where, where there is no one to bury. And actually the land has been given over to various <coughs> uh, organizations free of charge to create memorials um, in the cemetery. Some of them are really, really quite effective. Um, so we've gone to the concentration camps, we've gone to the cemeteries, we've gone to the places where uh, people have been deported. Uh, this happens to be outside of Paris, this is Dry City. There are many other sites of, of deportation that we've gone to. We've gone to um, ghettos. This happens to be the Warsaw Ghetto. And some of the imagery of the Warsaw Ghetto we found particularly <laughs> particularly more. Basically, because we enjoy fun, we basically spent hours upon hours visiting, observing, interviewing those who design, those who run, those who visit the sites of commemoration. And we keep asking ourselves, um, what do these narratives say? What do these sites say? to people who visit? What do these sites say to people who live nearby? What's the vocabulary of commemoration? What's the vocabulary of memorials? Whether linguistic or aesthetic, what's the message when creating a memorial in place and at this time? Now, our search for tokens of remembrance began in Paris, because we're biased for Paris, very simple, and began here. So <coughs> how many of you have been to Paris and experienced the site? So I should say that talking about this tonight is tinged by the, um, the site of Notre Dame being engulfed in flames. Um, that's what's seared in our minds right now, and the fact that we were physically affected, physically sick, watching 
the Trudan and Gelfin Plains. This photograph was taken a number of years ago. Now, how many of you have seen, know what, what you're looking at at this point? Yeah. Ah, that's right. One person? No, Ah, go ahead. So, you can see there's a curious little window at the tip of the Ilse And so, essentially, at the back of Notre Dame, maybe even in some of the news footage that you saw of the, of the fire, you may have seen, there's a garden at the back of Notre Dame. You could also have You're lunch, say, lunch okay. behind Notre Dame. Okay. No, never mind. No. There's a whole series of jokes or plunge behind Notre Dame. Go ahead. I did. We had practices that I didn't. I. I, know, I didn't I know, know. say that until just now. All right. Um, there's no. There is no joke level beneath which you will not say. So, <laughs> me, so he wants that lunch back of Notre Dame. But over the years, we have done a lot of research back of Notre Dame. And so what you have is a garden at the back of Notre Dame, a small street, a couple of gates, and then a small garden. And it's this garden that leads to the tip of Notre Dame, to what might be seen as almost a, an arrow, or the, the tip of an arrow, right into the heart of the center. Now, what's there is something called the memorial to the deportees. It descends into the Seine, and it's a memorial that was inaugurated by Charles de Gaulle in April of 1962, which was, what, 17 years after the end of World War II. And what we have found over many years is that this site is a strange, moving, haunting memorial that takes the visitor into a kind of claustrophobic cave of memory. It's run by two government organizations. It's the uh, Ministry of Defense, but it's also a veterans organization. <coughs> and it's called Memorial to the Deportation. And this is the path in through that part. Now, over, let's just show them uh, some of this, okay? As you walk from the back of Notre Dame, you walk through this path, and there are two paths like this on, on either side. And in between, you see this image, the Martyrs to Deportation. And then you see, if you're there at the right time, a rose garden, and the rose garden is dedicated to the victims of the Ravensbrück. Now, over the years, we've done a lot of this ethnographic research, and we photographed that site, inside and out. Let's show some more of those slides. So you come you go you down the steps. Come down the steps. You're on a, on a level with the with this garden. And then you have a steep set of steps down on either side. So if you were looking outward, you'd look toward the tip of the Seine, where that the series of, of uh, what do you call it, metal pieces are there. Now let's go to the next one. This was the model, essentially, the original model for that site. Now, if you'll notice, when we talk later, we show the, the additional slides, um, you've got two wings off of a center, a, a, a center room. And if actually, this is very, very small. And so the tip of the island is the end of that diagram. And the two wings um, are part of the, the commemoration. That long strip in the middle is, um, if you'll, would you see the images? Let me point out. Filled with light. I want to point out one thing. Right over here and over here, there's a gate. And that gate has a guard behind it, generally. Now, we don't know why at that point. We didn't know why the guard was there, but we saw, we saw him. Um, show some more. Here's the exterior. 
And a big part of the experience is if you'll notice the texture, this is very hard to walk on. So as soon as you come down the steps, you are on pavement that is somewhat disorienting. You're not quite sure where to put your feet to get to get solid. Similar to where we but not as much. And then you see the um, the water rushing by. Um, life goes on and you're encased in this memorial. And you walk through these two blocks. And that's what's inside. And that's the center and with two wings off of it. With how many bulbs? 200,000. That line is 200,000 bulbs representing the 200,000 200, deportees. Someone. There's also a tomb of um, An the, the, of the unknown deportee. deportee. It's another shot we took. So Each one of those triangles there represents an extermination camp. Okay? Go on. That's the flame again. That's the second one. And this retreats into a closer off shot. Now, I have to admit that what we were about to confront was our own stupidity and our realization that we didn't know what we were doing, which happens frequently. <laughs> Over a period of several years, we're doing our research on that particular site. We photographed it inside and out, and our experiences turned out that even we, the great researchers, are susceptible to preconceived notions and the arbitrariness of language. At one point, we discovered that the memorial contained a second floor. That second floor was referred to as the superior room. It is generally closed. You need special permission from the government in order to enter. And once a year, they have such an event. We have contacted the organizations that were involved and the guard who recognized me said, push me in. We went up the steps, and what we found was something totally different. So as you come, you've got a, sec a center room, two wings. The two wings lead to uh, staircases that are always barred. And then once or twice a year, they're open. Um, the experience that we had was we were invited well, doing an interview. They said, come back in a couple of days if you're here for having the event. You come back, and at the end of the event, those bars are lifted, and you can go upstairs. And this is what you find upstairs. Here, one more. Now, when you, when you look at that, and you look, are, are there, is there many more in this? Do you have any more? Yeah. This is a very moving area. But it's, why is it not ever open? We didn't, we didn't have the answer to some extent. We still don't have the answer. But what we were seeing was concentration camp, concentration camp, concentration camp, extermination. Well, what happened? Let's well, go. One of the things that we found was that in opening the second floor, um, they have and tried to develop it into a mature, more uh, a multimedia educational environment. And um, as of 2016, there are ways of arranging to have educational groups uh, go and see films and have access more frequently um, than existed before. Our initial experience was in 1992. About that time, as we were walking, if you know Paris, as we were walking from the Marais, the old Jewish section, which is now a fashionable part of Paris, walking toward the Ile Cité, we came across the memorial to the La Shoah. And we looked at it. 
And he said, we have to arrange an interview with someone there to find out the significance of this. We finally managed to do that. And on a very hot and muggy day in Paris, as Paris can get very bad in the summer, there was no air conditioning. We began to, to, to talk to the director of the show. And we asked him a very simple question. What, how did he feel about the Holocaust Memorial on the Seine? And he looked at us and said, what Holocaust Memorial? At that point, we experienced something called flop sweat. What have we been photographing? What is it that we were looking at? Clearly, <laughs> there was great animosity in, in, in terms of what we found on the same and this particular memorial between the Marais and Cité. So we ran back to the memorial. This was a couple, after a couple of years of research, I'm embarrassed to, to mention it. Well, what, what we were trying to do at the time was to do ethnographic research, through interviews, and through using um, some of the methodologies that we learned about through environmental um, design, environment behavior research, um, through our work with the Environmental Design and Research Association, we were trying to incorporate some of their research techniques for observation of, of the memorial. So we really thought that we were on top of things, in incorporating these social scientific research methods. So we ran back and we began, began photographing again. And then we realized something, that outside, outside the memorial, we found these marks. Now, these marks refer to anyone considered to be, well, so anyone who, who the French thought could be exterminated. These now, what, what you're these seeing the, here. These are the deportees. The deportees. This is who they defined as Jewish political prisoner, gypsy, Jehovah's Witness, stateless person, antisocial individual. Another stateless person, I don't know what, what, why we repeated it, antisocial person, a homosexual, a professional criminal, and Jews. All of those could be combined in one person. You know? Now, what's significant here is that this information is outside the, outside the memorial. You saw the grassy area, right along there is what, where we found this information. Now, in addition to that, there is some detailed information that is periodically updated. So this is an example of what the update was through, 19, through 2012, um, explaining who they define as deportees, what they mean by that arbitrary word. But really, at the heart of the problem is how the French or how to the French, deportees is defined. Even after multiple visits to the site, we were wrong to assume that the memorial was commemorating the annihilation of French Jews. Um, we didn't understand the nuances of what the concept of deportees was to the French. By the way, if you look at that, at that <laughs> photograph, what you see on the top there, the word Sachsenhausen. And what was Sachsenhausen? There was a concentration camp. We took those as triggers. So when we walked in and we saw the names of all the concentration camps and the eternal flame, we interpreted that as a commemoration to Jews. We were wrong. What was missing? Anyone want to guess what was missing? What had, what mistake that Sue and I made? something that we should have noticed right away. There's a word that was missing. We, Jew. Nowhere in that memorial does one see the word Jew. So what we learned was that the French interpretation was that 
we were all victims. That all French suffered. And therefore, um, it, there's a very, very different concept that drove the vision of, the, of, the, of this commemoration, of this memorial. So this led us to look more carefully at the language of the memorial itself. When you come in, the very first thing that you see um, is actually overhead, before you get to this, um, a, uh, a sign that says, they descended into the mouth of the earth and they did not return. Then you enter into that little round amphitheater. That's yes, not true. And then you enter the amphitheater and you see this. You see, forgive, do not forget, which is often attributed to Golda Meir or my grandmother. I'm not sure. <laughs> they, they both used it. Um, and then you see um, carved installations from um, Sartre, from uh, Descartes, from uh, Satsuburi. Um, there are, are philosophers and literary figures and small quotes from, from them surrounding these triangles that list all of the, 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 uh, the concentration camps. Can now, I ask a quick question? Essentially, what, what we, it's hard done speak French, it's written in the tutoyer. It's written like you would say to a friend or a child. Why is it not pardonné? That's a big language thing. Did you ask right. that? Did you ask them that? Why is it pardon and not pardonné? No. no. But, but that says something. I'm sorry. Just no, no, go ahead. That's, it's very good because there, there are follow-ups. This is, you have to understand, this is a world of progress. In every interview, that we have had, every experience that we've had, has been kind of a hard fought experience. So that's the kind of thing in a follow up interview that we can actually. Well, well, that's also one of the reasons we're here tonight in terms of general semantics, because it's, it essentially says that there's much more here, but the nature of language is extremely important. So essentially, what, what we've learned is that the French use the concept of deportee. Uh, as a way of um, dealing with um, victimization in France after the war. And after liberation, after the celebration, there was division. There was um, French on French violence. There was um, violence between collaborators versus the resistance. Um, and so to try to move beyond that term, and to foster national unity. A decision was made by de Gaulle and by provincial governments to promote the vision of a unified France. And the idea was that all suffered, all French, all resisted occupation. And this actually became known as the Gaullist myth. Mm. So, that is, I think, what we're seeing embodied in this major, and what we thought, and we've always thought, was one of the most moving Holocaust memorials that we've ever had. And that took us 10 years to figure out. <laughs> so, this, the, sh the notion of shared sacrifice is really at the heart of it. And the decision was made to treat all deportees the same, the same despite the fact that if you look at the figures, um, of French deportees, 97% of those deported from France were Jews. But we'll treat all the same. Are there any Jewish stars in it? Uh, no. No. The, the closest you can get is um, the, triangles. And some, yeah, the triangles and some of the imagery. Second floor really leads you to, to see this, that the 90% of those exterminated Jews. You don't get that on the first floor. You're not meant to get it. What's really interesting is that you know, we look at Holocaust memorials in countries and country after country, and this ambiguity regarding who's being commemorated doesn't really exist anywhere else. And 
that concept of using the language of deportation, using the language of deportee, is, is really uniquely French. Now this gets us to the next variation in searching for the traumas of the past. Uh, this actually, let me, before I do that, the kind of in-your-face memorial that you see here is this kind of thing as you walk in the streets of Paris. In this case, it, it commemorates young children who were in, a, in the school who were deported in 1942. So now let me go back to the in-your-face memorial. So what we have, we were studying over a long period of time, we were studying established memorials and looking at the language <coughs> both the architectural language and the linguistic choices that were made in these memorials. But over time, what we've really been most moved by were what we've come to call in-your-face memorials. Um, there must be a more elegant way of describing them, but we call them in-your-face memorials. Those that you encounter in everyday life when you least expect of the power of the rhetoric of surprise, of discovery, is, is part of why these are so um, effective, so influential, at least in our view. And so um, we found that the destination memorials that we've been talking about are way less effective than the ones that you encounter when you least expect. So, so whether it's a commemoration on the side, and linguistically these are interesting as well, um, whether it's commemoration on the side of a, uh, of a school on an average French street. This now this is a street where I, where I stay all the time, and on that street is a school. And outside of the school is this plaque. And so as you're walking to the cafe in the morning, passing this plaque, which very often has flowers or um, faded flowers from some commemorative event, those are the things that really move us much more than the destination memorials, like the deportees or the show of that, that we've been talking about. Um, it, 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 it's ultimately these in-your-face memorials that we really want to talk about tonight. By the way, um, walking down the block, coming here, there's an in-your-face memorial. Um, we parked the car about a block and a half down. There's a parking lot at 32, Gramercy Park, and uh, it's a synagogue. A synagogue, and then in the synagogue, right next to this parking the, the parking garage, um, there are um, there, there's a gate, and right behind the gate, you encounter a plaque that is a an in-your-face memorial commemorating the uh, the victims of the Holocaust. So going from where we parked the car to here tonight, we encountered one of those. And those are the ones that really resonate with us. Now this gets us to the next area. It's a personal one. I'm going to tell you a story. I was reading Russell Shorthub. You know his work? Marvelous, marvelous writer. Um, wrote a book on Amsterdam, wrote a book on New York, and recently came out with another one. And I'm reading this, and about page seven, he is interviewing a Holocaust survivor in Amsterdam. And about, well, I, I highlighted, it says, Frieda's childhood home was an apartment on a wide boulevard that was then called Zuder Amstelland, but that afterwards was renamed Roosevelt Line. Well, it was a startling point because that's where I lived. I lived at 147 Amstelland. Well, if that doesn't shake you up, nothing will. But this is not a story about me. It's a story about something else. I revisited that apartment, managed even to get in. And they were looking down the street. And I think the nature of the apartments are important. The Dutch do not build high. They're three-story flats. Now, as we walk down to this, and I'm reading Shorto, and Shorto is saying, 
that was another Jewish family that lived around the corner. And the narrator, the narration, short as narration, takes us from 147, Zuder Amstelan, to 37 Medbeck Plain. It's a two block walk. And we're now in a small park in front of a similar series of three four apartments. In front of that address was a, a blue bicycle chained to the front of the building. And then suddenly we looked down and we saw the following. Here, Bonte, you live on Frank. Born in 1929, uh, fled to Holland from Germany in 1934, interned in Westerbrook, deported in 1944, went to Bergen-Belsen and was put to death in March of 1945. Now, there's something to shake you up that shook me up. Did I play with Anne Frank? The possibility is that I did. But she was four year, three and a half years older than I was at that point. But this is what we discovered. And in front of the house then, we see that her, her uh, Stolpersteiner, her stumbling block was one of four placed in front of the house. It's interesting because it's right opposite the small park. And when we went to the small park, we saw it's very, very modest. And if any of you have visited the Anne Frank house, which has become this mammoth museum, lines around the block, you have to order a ticket months in advance. The juxtaposition of that part of the Anne Frank story versus where she actually lived rather than hid um, is, is, is quite startling. And we're standing in the park looking at this small, very effective um, statue, and people are pointing to us, so you know, she lived there, go over there, look at that. There's a, an effort to engage because there aren't a lot of people around. So if we're there, there seem to be um, this invitation to interact. How many of you have seen these Stolpersteiner, these what they call stumbling stones? Where, where did you see it? Where did you see it? it must have been in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam? Anyone else who have seen them? Of course, they were all over Europe. We were talking about approximately 70,000 <coughs> such stones. Um, now, we've seen them in Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Belgium, and the Czech Republic. Right now, there are over 70,000 <coughs> scattered around Europe. It's the largest um, dispersed installation of any kind of commemoration around the world. And interestingly, um, of the places that we've gone, um, sometimes it's the places where you don't find them that you would expect to find them um, that are um, real clues to uh, the fact that they may be a little bit more contentious um, than at, at first glance they might might appear to be. Um, so for example, with all the deportations in Paris, there are no Stroposteiner in Paris yet. So this is a work of progress and we are still trying to investigate why not. We know that there, there are both- And my French states. Yep. There are bones of contention uh, in other cities, but we haven't even heard of any kind of coverage of confrontation or contestation in Paris itself. So that's one of the next things that we, we plan on looking into. So this is where, in Germany, this is where um, 
some of the places in one area where they are. Now, what's interesting for me at least is the one that says number 18 uh, is Dusseldorf, where I lived as a child. But there's a classic example of what we would call in your face memorials. Um, perhaps more aptly, um, that should be considered um, under your feet commemorations. Um, this strange now, uh, uh, You have to look at this carefully now because you can, it's easy to romanticize these stones. But you see that the three there along a road. Where did I take that? This is in Berlin. This was in Berlin. So there's the sidewalk, and there are the stones. It's gone. Now, at some point, after going to Düsseldorf, I, we went for a visit to Dietenstein, where my grandmother and grandfather lived. It's near the town of Kassel, for those of you who are purists and need to know where it is. And we, it was very, it was a very strange experience, a small village, which I remember because at that point I was four years old and I remember and I could pick out the house where we lived. We, have, we came to the village, I don't know what day it was, was it a Sunday or and we stopped at the Rod House, the mayor's office, and we introduced myself, I introduced myself as Herr Kumput, and he looked at us and he said, I can arrange, uh, can I find out any more information? And he said, well, I can arrange for tomorrow, the museum will be open, and they will have a record of your grandparents and your grandfather and so on. But here's the key. Key to what? Let's show. The key to the cemetery. Having never been, he didn't know who I was except by my name. And here was my family going back 500 years. But no one has been buried there since 1933 and the rise of Hitler. All Jews born after that were put into a special, another cemetery, which I'm not sure where that is. It, it was very interesting because when we did go to the museum, they were able to say um, to the date when his grandparents left. Um, and they said they were the last people to, they stayed as long as they could, and they were the last people to leave and survive. And they, where did they go? Any guess? 1940? Answer. Roosevelt didn't let any Jews in. Answer. Shanghai. Answer. Shanghai, China. And there was a huge Jewish population and a quarter in Shanghai, which I later visited. But out of this visit, um, and having to wait an extra day to get into the museum to find out more, we went to local towns. And one of the local towns that we went to, um, took us to a, a synagogue, and we uh, were standing outside the synagogue that had been preserved. As it turned out, um, the synagogue, the exterior looked beautiful, um, and we looked down and saw this, and what we no. found... Well, actually, we, we didn't know where the hell we were standing. Uh, so we had made a date with a woman, a Jewish woman who was, had come back to live in Germany, and she said, look down. And we looked down, and there we were standing on a stalker stein. And so, even in these kind of rural towns, you're finding these commemorations. Um, we happen to be outside the synagogue, that when you went inside, the facade has been preserved, the inside of the kind of music school. But the point is, it's a very moving experience of looking down, being out the countryside, and there embedded in the ground was this history, it's this, this very personal history. So the first stumbling stones are laid in the public domain. They become part of the property of the relevant town. So they're not being they're not being embedded or placed in private property, which raises an important point because um, 
since they are in public property, um, they rely on a degree of um, consensus with those responsible for embedding the, the, the stones and the civic po political or administrative representatives of a locality to say you can use public space, publicly owned space, for this. Sure. Now the first one. Go back one. This is the individual that started the whole process. Right, so the small brass Holocaust memorial plaques in these either residential areas or in embedded in um, communal areas um, were initiated by this sculptor, uh, Goethe Deming, who is from Cologne. And um, much has been written about, he's become a celebrity, much has been written about his efforts. Um, we are still in the process of trying to finalize an interview with him. We've managed to interview the whole bureaucracy um, that is formed around him. So essentially, the story of Deming is that um, in Cologne, he came up with this idea in the late 1990s of creating these very individualized um, commemoration stones that he put outside originally of Cologne administrative um, offices and the, the cathedral in Cologne, and ultimately uh, in Berlin. And it was a one-man show, one-man band, and he thought that this was going to be um, just a very, very small-scale installation. It's taken on a life of its own. It has a um, bureaucracy, it's been institutionalized, it has a small staff that's located in, in Belgium, or we've inter excuse me, in the Brussels, in Berlin, <laughs> and um, we've interviewed them, um, and it's become this, um, this large-scale um, installation. And for many years, he was the only one working on this. Now he's pretty much the only one who installs them, although there are other people involved in processing applications. So for example, if you get on their website, you learn that don't even think about applying for uh, installing one of these stones prior to 2020, they're booked on. Now, these commemorative stones are supposed to be personal testaments to a massive horror. And they're trying, according to Demi, to bring the Holocaust to a human scale. So the first 50 were placed in 1996. And um, first in Dusseldorf, Gary was concerned with Dusseldorf, first in Dusseldorf were installed in uh, 2003. And um, the material that was provided to us by the um, Dusseldorf Memorial Center, we found particularly helpful. Um, one of their documents explains the, their view of the importance of these stumbling stones. What they say is, what the stumbling stone project importantly accomplishes is to give back to the victims their identity and contextualizes their life stories in their hometown, thus opening the way for constructive dialogue. Now what's particularly important in the process of creating this in stumbling stones um, is that it's initiated by a sponsor. <coughs> so in Gary's case, for example, um, the stones, by the way, uh, the earlier stones really focus on those who perished. And as time has gone on, um, those who have survived can also apply the stumbling stones. Um, in Gary's case, it's he was thinking uh, originally that his uncle who died in Auschwitz would be the one person who could apply for one of these stones. But over time, he realized that um, in um, the town in, in Nagelstein, um, family members could be commemorated there. Um, they would require the, the approval of the town. And that's where some really interesting controversy has, has emerged. Let me interrupt. interrupt. Notice, by the way, here there's a, a walkway. This is actually in Berlin, and there are two Stolpersteine. Here are two more. And that's a particularly, leave that up, because I, I, I want to make a comment here. Because we have a personal problem here. 
We don't agree with each other in regards to the Stolper That's because you're wrong. Because I'm right. <laughs> We're in disagreement in regard to the efficacy of the, of the stones. Remembrance is often not convenient, but there are communities that have objected to the process. <coughs> we, I object to them to some extent because I don't want to see dog shit on them, and I don't want to see cigarettes, and I don't want to see garbage on it. So we have a disagreement here as to whether or not um, this is something that I want to get involved with and put a stalker stone in from where I lived in Düsseldorf or where I lived, uh, where, where, my own, uh, where I lived in, in uh, Amsterdam. Um, there's also, there, for me, I've always been interested in pavements and streets. I always thought when I was young that I could run along the streets of Philadelphia and if I skipped hard enough I would fly. I was wrong. I still can't fly if I run fast enough. <laughs> but there was something about streets and the textures and the, of the street that I felt. And, and in a way, when I look at this, I am reminded of the next slide. Not here, not here, here. These are the Nazi stormtroopers. Now I may well, just romanticize stormtroopers, but I, my mind suddenly goes that this is a place where we're feet were hitting the ground. We're hitting the streets. Because we've and been thinking of this as an under your feet memorial. And apparently, this is the image that's conjured in, in Gary's mind. Now, the most recent community um, in which Stolpersteiner were at it was last year in Antwerp, where the city decided to initiate the laying of the stones. Notice the phrase. The city decided to initiate the laying of the stones. But that act was met by a strong, by strong resistance from the Jewish community. Michael Freilich, the first Jew elected to the Belgian parliament, objected. And he wrote, the fact is that these stones are there and that it is enormously disrespectful. When it comes to commemorating Jews, and he's an angry Jew, they are there, but we de when we defend Israel, they're the first to attack us. And so suddenly we also come across another conflict that is equating Jews with Israel. And in, 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 a, in a way, the Stolperstein had really nothing to do with the establishment of Israel. In July of 1915, and here's a... 2015. Huh? Let's fast forward 2015. 2016, I saw it. Here you see a, a garden area in Germany or a little park, and in the front, just at the apex, there's an old, another Stolper standing. I don't, I'm not sure whether it calls attention to itself. I, I, we've been playing with the concept of unobtrusive commemoration. Some of them really do blend into the environment. Um, where was I? Oh. The, uh, in, in Munich, uh, the city council of the ban on the placement of the cobblestone, uh, of the plaques. Munich implemented its ban on the stones 11 years ago uh, after Charlotte Knopfloch, leader of the city's Jewish community and former president of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, said that they were not respectful of the victims they intended to honor. Knobloch explained that people murdered in the Holocaust deserve better than a plaque in the dust, dirt street, and even filth. At the time of Park Knobloch's statement, lobbyists believed that they had garnered the necessary support in the city council to overturn the ban. The city's mayor, at that time, Dieter Ryder, supported the project 
as did the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the Yad Vashem Memorial in Israel. Um, in Amsterdam, uh, we come across one of the strangest reactions we've ever come across in terms of it. We were, we were not far from the, the house I showed you earlier where we were having a coffee and we asked, uh, can you tell us where some of the Stolkersteiner were and what were the reactions to it? And what did the woman say? Well, we start getting reactions from the local community and what we're told was the community uh, is very proud of, of having the Stolkersteiner made welcome them. Although there's one group of people of one block that has filed a complaint because they're saying that these are self, they, they call them self-polishing stones, so the more you walk on them, the brighter they get. That's cool. Well, Go ahead. and they claim that too many people were walking them on them, they were getting too bright, and that given that they don't have curtains or uh, shades or blinds <laughs> and their windows, that there was a glare coming in, so they wanted them removed because it was a public nuisance. That usually it is a philosophical basis upon which they're kept out. Frequently, it's a, a Jewish community uh, leader that's fighting the installation. Amsterdam is a, a bit different. There is also another city in Germany called Milligan, a city of 80,000 people uh, in the Black Forest area, which is, which is generally the more conservative uh, area of, of, of Germany, where the Schultz of 19 former residents have not been installed. The town council has twice refused permission to, to show these privately funded memorials uh, on public property. Many of the Villigan uh, citizens objected to in facing the history of the Jews. Auf Schritt and Schritt which is, which is an interesting concept. This is what they objected to. That, and what they were referring to is, why the hell do I have to be reminded of what happened in Germany every minute of the time? But there's another translation of that. Uh, I mean, if you look it up in Google, you'll see at every turn or every step of the way, my interpretation is that of every stride, in every step and somehow that that captures the objection that they did not want to be around us they did not want to be reminded of of the of the events um, the leader of the christian democratic uh, union renata bruning objected maintaining that marking the sidewalk in front of specific homes might give the impression that their current owners benefited financially from the third rice theft of Jewish property. Um, so that the, you, you can see the element of, of fascism in, in that reaction. Now others say that in favor of, of these installations, um, they require people to stop, to pause, to look down. And in the process of looking down, whether they're photographing or not, was in, in Prague. Um, if you if you bend down to take note of these stones, in that way you're paying homage. That's to total baloney. I don't believe that. Okay. You really need to get the thing. <laughs> so there there is a lot of controversy. The far right neo Nazis also joined in and maintained that Stolpersteiner was just simply a, a money making proposition by the creator. Um, to charge for stumbling stones. The stumbling stones cost about 120 euros or $135. Um, most of them were covered by donations. Um, there are, and certainly in Germany, there are associations that that uh, instigate the, the installations and they, they cover the cost. Um, if it's an individual that is applying for the installation, then they may have to cover up to 120 euros. Um, but the objections to these in-your-face memorials, or the under the feet Holocaust memorials, um, surprisingly have, um, while they're objected to, have also um, developed quite a following. And so there are some that have upped the technological ante um, and will follow Stolpersteiner 
from place to place around a city. And there are QR codes that have, embed, have been embedded in some where um, you can scan the history of the area um, in terms of what the Jewish community or what the community was before. Um, there are others who have created um, apps so that you can traverse a city and learn about that city through the app of um, linking you to through the Stolperstein. Um, the bottom line is, is that the path of Holocaust memorials is in your feet, <coughs> under your feet, Holocaust memorials, um, have become um, institutionalized. There is a, a, a set language used in order to, um, to get one and what the alliance what the appropriate language is for each one is very significant. Can I, let me jump one second, Sue, because I think one of the things I want to stress, and we may not have stressed enough, is that the stumbling stones are on public property. They are not part of the building that in, in which a Jew may have lived. So the distinction between public and private is, I think, an important point. And if you go to the website, this is to the main Stolperstein website, they give you advice. So for example, um, not only are there stipulations about the language that's, that's being used, but they stipulate that um, they recommend, for example, that um, the local community be involved. So if the request for one of these stones comes from a family, ask the, uh, the local community. Uh, they recommend that um, if, it's, if, the, uh, if it's being instigated by a local community, that they contact surviving uh, family members to see, invite them to, to come to laying of the stone to see if they object. Um, they also encourage uh, in inviting school children to be involved because there is a, 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 a substantial uh, history in which the young are very, are very interested um, in this form of commemoration. But the bottom line is, is that the philosophy of these stones is that there is one victim, one stone. There's no collective stone strength. They're placed in front of the last residence of choice rather than a place where people were forced to go. And um, linguistically, the way that each is written, it starts out with here lived, which for, for the Deming, Everyone who died in the concentration camp was murdered. That's the term that he uses. And therefore, the most common faith is murder. And, and so it's whatever language they are installing these, these stones, they look for the word for murder. The, the word in German is ermordet. Or, or some of them are flight into death. The German word is looked in the in the right. Right. and so that's suicide. Or the word emigrated is not used. They they will not install some something called emigrated. Instead, they insist on using certain words. The word escape, and then the year and the destination. That's what they will do. But there are words that they will reject if those who are requesting these stones. Uh, ask for, for that use of language. And the fate is not known, they include the, the concept of fate unknown. Schicksal unbekannt. And if somebody survived a concentration camp, then they say, use the word liberated, not the word survived. What's that? So the inscriptions are in the language of the, um, the country in which they're being placed. So, for example, this is Italy. These are placed in Greece, and the stones are in, in Greece. Um, these are in, uh, I think this is the, is the German or the I can't see it. Um, I think it's Prague. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that they, they try to tailor, it's the same language choices, but they tailor it to that particular language. Now, in one strange experience that we have, and to try to just wrap up our discussion of Stoppelsteiner, um, because we could talk on, obviously, on this for hours. Um, we were very affected by a, a kind of a bizarre personal experience that we had uh, in the summer of 2017. 
and we had arranged, so we had arranged to interview the people who, in this small group that run the Stoffelstein organization, there are only a handful of people. Um, we had arranged to interview everyone who was in the Berlin office. And then they suggested that there was one more person that we that we contact. And that is the uh, a man by the name of Michael Friedrich Friedlander, uh, who actually physically makes the stones. There's only one person that makes the stones. And um, in the Atlea in um, Panko, which is a suburb of, uh, a northeast suburb of, of Berlin, um, we took several trams and ended up um, at this house. In, um, this is the, the street that, it was a cold, cold rainy, day. rainy day in Berlin. And we we're walking down the street wondering, where the hell are we? These are all private houses. And then um, we came to the end there. You can see the house at the very end. And it had a garage next to it. And that turned about turned out to be a private residence and the atelier of Mr. Friedlander. Um, and we... By the way, as a scholar, any interview that you make the subject cry uh, is probably, I don't know, an effective interview. <laughs> But we had him in tears during the interview. He's a very strange man. Uh, wearing earrings. Uh, infinitely sad. But uh, we talked to him at, at great length. Each of those Stoffer Steiner is created by hand. It's a manufacturing process, but clearly it's done by a human being who's devoted to the task. And it was the process of watching him transfer the written information that he had in front of him in a quiet way onto a 3.9 inch square brass plate upon which the names and the life dates of most of those who were exterminated was placed. Um, it was almost watching a piano tuner at work. Uh, methodically preparing the piano for its performance. It was at that moment that the spell of the process, the sadness of memory, was felt by both of us. It was the emotion and the motion of the scribe that was communicated. As described in the Tagerspiel, which is a German newspaper, and I translated, and I hope I get it right. In his left hand, he holds the hand punch, an eight centimeter long metal pin, and supports his left forearm. The right hand grasps a hammer, weighing 800 grams, which it adjusts, which it adjusts horizontally over the metal pin. Quickly, he lets it, the hammer fall on the flattened head of the stem. Rhythmically, he sets the hammer on a metal rail. The left one reaches for the next pin. I'm very effective looking at that. The names mean something to you. The individual nature of the commemoration is key. Where extermination was on a large scale, stones were designed to be individual. Uh, very personal. And Friedlander, um, the idea of what the Talmud says, that a person is only forgotten when his or her name is forgotten. That really resonated with him. Yeah. That's what we walked away with. That, 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 that this was not, um, this was not a, a business venture, this was not a, um, get famous venture. This is something that is taking a toll on him. Um, and the time to think of each name as he writes each name, each letter. Now, with this, this, this small organization uh, that in Berlin that runs these installations, um, it's really interesting to talk to them uh, about the controversies that develop. One of the controversies that really interested me was the fact that they never thought 
that this was going to be a monopoly. They wanted to encourage other people to do things that were similar on this kind of individual basis um, and encourage um, kind of a distribution of this idea. However, what's happened over time is that clearly um, they have a sense of ownership and of intellectual property uh, ownership, and they're very aware that they can do only a certain number of stones at any given time. Uh, and what they found is that there are places that in order to uh, commemorate, let's say, a whole town, a town will make a, a copy of these stones and put one example they gave us was a town that did 14 of them in one day, and of course we couldn't possibly have accommodated that. That in turn led them to question whether their intellectual property rights had been violated. And so they want them to emulate the stones, they don't want them to copy the stones exactly. And there's now some discussion and some litigation going on about the intellectual property of the stones. The last thing that I would like to point out about these, the Schuppelsteiner are that they're now going abroad. Of the 70,000 stones that exist, they're all in Europe. They're all in places where people um, were deported, where they escaped, where they escaped to. Um, but what seems to be changing is now, for the first time in 2017, um, they're going abroad. They're going outside of Europe. We interviewed um, Anna Water, who is the woman who runs scheduling, and uh, Anna Thomas, who was the person in charge of of international relations, and Anna Thomas was on her way to Buenos Aires because that was the first place in 2017 where a stone was going to be placed outside of Europe. And the idea was that the stones would uh, be placed outside, this is a, a German school, outside of the place where those who took refuge in Buenos Aires uh, resettled and went to school. <laughs> A change, a shift in the um, in the sense of where these stones appropriately should go and what the message of these stones. Well, are. Let me. We have a couple more minutes. Don't go too long, so no, we don't want to go too long. And, and if you're getting tired, don't raise your hand. Um, we'll just quickly go through the whole list. Our, our our system of, a, of of research is very carefully um, done. Uh, we stumble from one thing to another, not really knowing what we're doing. And in this case, uh, what, what happened is we went to Berlin, and, we, and a number of years ago, I don't know what year it was, and we visited a, a friend of mine uh, who lived in a place called the Bavarian Quarter, the yeah. Irish and Devil. We actually went to Berlin interviewing people who were involved in the controversy over, this, this was before the big uh, installation to the uh, memorial to the um, to the Jews of Europe, that was installed in Berlin. We went and interviewed the people at the time that were involved in that controversy. So while we're there, we arranged to go meet this friend who lives in the Bavarian. If you know Berlin, it's about a, a kilometer uh, from KDB, which is a very, very famous department store, very fashionable department store. And these are the kind of buildings. I, one could spend hours talking about the architecture. Um, uh, look carefully because you already see something uh, that we want you to notice. But this was a very private community in which 16,000 Jews lived and of which 6,000 Jews were exterminated. It was a very upscale area, uh, which was ultimately taken over as a place of residence by the SS. But among the residents who had to leave, Albert Einstein around the corner from, from um, Show the next one, which we just found out about. Just found out about this one. Another local resident, Walter Benjamin. So these were all people living there, who, who obviously um, met their death or, or ran away. My friend said, "Let me show you something." With a smile on her face, she took us out. And what did we find? Go to the next slide. This is what we found signposts. Go to the next one. Um, let me translate. This one says Haberlandstrasse. Uh, it is essentially saying that the name of, of, of streets that were named after Jews have to be renamed. 
So essentially, you've got a sign on lab posts. One side is a pictogram, the other side is one of the Nuremberg laws. Let's try another one. Do we have more? Oh, these are a whole series of them, just to show you the extent of these. There are 80 of these throughout this small Bavarian quarter. Go ahead. Any more? Well, right. this one, uh, this one refers to that Jews cannot sing in choirs anymore. Now, what, what is particularly interesting about this, uh, and here uh, on the left, uh, groceries, uh, Jews can only buy groceries in Berlin uh, after, in the afternoon, from four to five. And that law was passed in 1940. But if you look on the right, the Jews in choirs are not allowed to sing, those are dated 1933. Mm. There, there are others. Uh, this is a sacrament. Uh, by the way, where they're placed is very strategic. So, so where you can't buy groceries, it's placed outside of what's still a supermarket. Where you can't buy bread, it's placed outside of what's still a bakery. And this is, uh, in terms of religious conversion, it's basically saying that if you convert, it won't save you. It's still a matter of race. Um, and this is placed outside the church. Some of the others, uh, you can see them we, that the, some of the others I, I, I have here, Jews are excluded from seeing any choirs. That was 1933. Aryans and non-Aryans are forbidden, forbidden to play together. That was 1935. Um, the baptism of Jews and the surrender to, to Christianity has no significance for the racial question because some Jews were, were going to be converted in order to escape from, from extermination. Well, the, the bottom line is, is we're walking through this residential section. It's a non-tourist section, it's a non-destination, and you're encountering these. And we became very uncomfortable with the fact that we were photographing all of these. But rather than feeling uncomfortable, people began to approach us and speak in some combination of German and English and engage and talk about these signs. And what we really came to understand and appreciate was that this community is using these signs um, to develop conversation about what happened. They bring children there. School is a big part of the, the children's education. But as people walk through the environment, as people walk through the environment, as people walk through the neighborhood, there is an open conversation about what went on here. And these are the these are the stimulants for the conversation. I have to give you one more law that was passed, which is journalists and their spouses have to prove their Aryan dis uh, heritage dating back to 1800. Otherwise, you couldn't be a journalist. But one of the really interesting things, though, about all of this is the publication of this and the invitation to communicate. So there have been multiple books. You can buy the poster. The, the poster of all of these signs is located in two places in the main public square. You can also buy the posters. Um, and um, There's a very interesting two-volume set that's been published, um, which includes all the names of the This really drives me, I, I found this actually today, looking at the two books, that because on Landschutterstrasse, where my friend lives, the list, that long list, are the Jews that were exterminated who lived on that street. And the volume that they put out lists every street in the Bavarian Quarter. One last Finish point. On. The idea of this neighborhood encouraging interaction about this uncomfortable issue um, is underscored by going to their community center by the Uban, where um, there's a lot of literature and um, a work workshops. And it's, it's, a, it's a very inviting environment, a little coffee house. But maybe more startling was we went into a school right opposite the main plots, right where the, the main public square. And 
in the school, they've incorporated this idea of commemoration as well. And so these are bricks outside of, um, or on the, on the periphery of a, uh, of a school playground. And essentially, what the children have been given is that each child is given the name of somebody from the community, and year after year, the children inscribe the names of the people who lived in that, the, the, lived in that community and who perished or were, were deported. And they're the ones creating their own memorial. And this is in their playground. So there's a really interesting communication dynamic in terms of encouraging interaction and discourse about what went on, remembering not forgetting. Now, there's no graceful way to end um, tonight's kind of a talk journey that we tried to take you on um, about remembrance. It is um, a compelling, maybe disturbing journey. Um, we could clearly intellectualize this. We can talk, for example, about the time-binding nature of, of these uh, installations. Um, but rather than intellectualizing, um, I think we'll finish up with um, Primo Levi meeting. Um, Primo Levi was an Italian Jewish chemist, and as a, um, a Brooklyn-born um, Jewish chemist's daughter, it seems only right to finish up with a with the chemist school. Um, the uh, survivor of Auschwitz, the famed author, wrote of his fellow inmates' perceptions that if we came back home and wanted to tell, we would be missing the words. So after 70 years, the words chosen and the medium of choice remains contentious, remains haunting, we think remains significant. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Are the early stones wearing to the point that they're becoming uh, just brass? Yeah. With that? Well, so there's a disappearance there? Good point. And the, the other, the other, that's, a, a, I guess the other question I had is, I always assumed that they were somewhat raised. You could stumble on them, but it's only a metaphor. No, exactly. Right. Yeah, actually, I think that's probably a fundamental reason why they've been approved by the municipal authorities. They don't, they don't create any kind of, um, of, of, a, of, of a real uh, hazard. I wish they. I wish people would trip over them. That yeah. they would be more, much more effective. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you had to learn about the bureaucracy, and there are several countries involved. And I'm curious about how they collaborated and came to this uh, decision that they would be this size and they would be made of brass. And my second thought is, we're referring to these as. Uh, Stones, but they're actually brass plates, and that, so it comes from tombstone, I assume. No, they come from the stones yeah. on the street. Oh, well, I see. You're thinking of, of copper on the streets, but the plaques are not stones. Exactly. It's, what was your first it's question? It's about, it's about six inches of cement and brass. I'm sorry. Nobody. How did all of the collaboration take place among these municipalities that are different bureaucracies and come to this uniform idea? It's very interesting. Well, in researching it, we found that there's a huge bureaucracy that's been created, emanating from Demic itself to people located in various countries around Europe. It seemed to be, rather than collaboration, it seemed to be more that they came and made an application on a, oh. a country by country, city by city basis, and they said, "This is all we're asking for." Exactly. And it's a very modest size, and that seems to get the approval. And then the bureaucracy. Yeah, I, I was interested to see that there were some in Greece, because the thing that struck me when I was in Saloniki was the fact that the German army had taken some of the tombstones and paved the streets, and you could actually sometimes see 
the Jewish letters. You're talking about Saloniki? Yes. In Saloniki, we're talking about 900,000 Jews who were, yes. uh, were, who were exterminated. And that was 80% of the population. Right. And for years, up until this time, there was no commemoration. There was a, a guarded synagogue and, right. and then the relics of, of, of the, uh, the cemetery. And where the hospital, there were two roads coming together and there was a very small uh, plaque place where the two, near the hospital, where they came together. That, it's, that, that I think has changed. I, but I think your point is very interesting. Yeah, I, I was there in 2002 and there were guards taking me to the hidden person that was leading the Jewish community with the, with at the, the time. the emphasis on it. And it wasn't until years later they, they created even a small commemoration. But so this is a real step forward. Wow. In that part. That, that's a big difference. And that's, Part of what has driven us through this whole project has been um, the idea that it's the places, whether the commemorations work or not, whether we just agree on them or not, is irrelevant. It's the places that have been most disturbing to us are the places that don't commemorate. And Salonika's one. Uh, I expected, the first time I went to Berlin, I expected to feel quite uncomfortable. And it was the absolute opposite. It was, they remember, it's in your face, it's everywhere, whether it's the large scale or particularly the, the small scale neighborhood ones, um, or the personal ones like the Stumble Stumps. Um, that's what I could deal with. I couldn't deal with the places where it was erased. Mm -hmm. Vienna, it was Vienna, for example, I, I can't stand in that sense. Um, I find Vienna very scary. I, I'm not sure why. Um, whereas Berlin, I find myself much more comfortable. And there's an irony here, obviously, as a Jew going back to Germany. Certainly. Yes. Um, are you going to Barcelona or anywhere in Spain? We're going. Next we're month. going to Barcelona next month or the end of this month. Can I come? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I. Ha I have been there. Uh, but not for a couple of years, and I, when I was in Barcelona, which is one of my favorite towns, it, it, I saw no commemoration there. It's so dominated by Gaudi and the, and, and the church and the playground and by the Miro uh, Museum. If you go online to the, the uh, Stolpersteiner main website, and there's the interactive map, you see some of the places where they've been located are really surprising. So rather than Barcelona, it might be in a rural area outside of Seville. And it's, it's very interesting where where he's gone to do this. Because everyone, or at least they like to say, that every one of these has been put in by Demi. So now that he's not making them himself, he is still installing them himself. And that's why it is a mm -hmm. finite number that can be installed. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're very, many of them are in rural areas. The other thing that's interesting about Germany, uh, when we went to Düsseldorf, we picked the hotel. We didn't realize that the hotel at one point was the Nazi headquarters. And uh, that hotel has been converted into, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, that was converted into a hotel. And it, it, was, very, it was very strange to be there because we went in on the return from Niedenstein, we walked in and they were very, very nice to us. And I said, can you tell me exactly when we left? Is there any way of finding out when we left uh, Dusseldorf um, to go to Amsterdam? And then, the, then after that, the Dutch would kick us out. And, and, and I have a, a letter which says, from the police chief saying, if you don't believe, um, by the end of December, we're sending you back to Germany. But the point of German efficiency is that he got on the phone. He said, ah, yes, uh, we have your address, <laughs> and you left on such and such a date, and we just got rid of any further information. Well, they said they had an open file on you for X number of months, and you were listed as missing. They knew you were gone, and they were searching for you. And the Germans were searching. And then That's what I was. They closed the oh, wow. case. I think it was eight months later. They closed yeah. the case. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the communities, uh, how memorials affect a community? The only way, the only place where we really know 
is in the case of the signposts in, in the uh, Bavarian order. Uh, because um, I have them here. They publish two volumes, the community, expressing what, what their feelings are. Um, it's, it's very difficult to figure out the memorial in Paris. It's, I don't know, because you have tourists stumbling in there who want to get out of the heat and they don't know what the hell they're watching. Well, that, that's, to me, one of the issues is the difference between visitor and those, those who live there. Yeah. And so in in the Bayerische Schedule, that's very much, it's not, a, it's not a destination and you don't get a lot of visitors there. We have and not so, seen any other tourists. So the information that we can get is very much about the community involvement, the community reaction. But in, in the, um, certainly in um, the, the, uh, the memorial to the deportees, it's, it's so public that even though it's somewhat hidden, it's subterranean, it's somewhat hidden, it's in a very, very public place in Paris, rather than looking at the, um, the more intimate commemorations of those plaques on, on school walls. Right. Um, so um, I, think, I think I was right. It's, that may be the only place to get place. a sense of local experience, other than the interviews that we've just begun. So this is a work of progress. Um, the interviews we've just begun on the people we're trying to say to people who have Strokersteiner outside of their home, how do you feel about this? And so we just started to talk to those people and literally to a person other than the hearsay that, of the, oh, we don't like the, the glare of the light, <laughs> to a person that we've spoken to, they said, oh, we're proud to have it. If we, we don't mind coming out and be reminded of the day. We think this is a good thing. That's the correct answer to give, but one could, yeah, man. Well, well, I, I just thought it was really interesting about the deportees in France, because France is, is the place that uh, the Jewish people were redefined. That is, Napoleon summons a Sanhedrin, a, an ancient institution, you know, to. Um, and has the Jews of France declare, sort of give up all claims to nationality and, and nationhood um, and, and state that they are only a religion in exchange for you know, emancipa emancipation and, what and, year, what year is that and citizenship. I, I don't recall, but, uh, and, and of course they, 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 came, they kind of pulled back on that later on. Um, but that was the beginning of the idea that Judaism is, is just a, a religion, and therefore uh, Jews of France are French and not Jews, you know, exactly. as a nationality. Exactly. Which leads me to ask, I mean, one nation that I hadn't heard mentioned and, and that I'm curious about is Poland, because they famously um, take that same tact of saying, the, you know, whatever, three million or Poles were killed in, in during World War II rather than Polish Jews. Is there, from Poland, it's a creepy place. Uh, that, that's a scholarly talking. Um, it's a very strange place. Uh, and we were very much affected by, by it. Huh? By what? It, by not by, by what by Warsaw, but by Krakow. Warsaw. Because Krakow is where the um, Schindler had his factory, and where uh, the the, the concert, which concentration camp um, Auschwitz was, and and what has happened there is that they've made this a tourist industry. So it's lost. There's not a Jew owning a store there, but they're making a lot of money. Uh, you, you don't even have to walk; they take you on a cart as you into the concentration camp. So it, 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 it's a disturbing place. Um, the ghetto in, in Warsaw itself is very strange. And they do, ha they do have the silver stone. They do. Yeah. They do have. Um, it, 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 it's one of the places you would expect it there, and it is there. Um, it's one, interestingly, the places that you would expect them to be that have been kept out and trying to find out the backstory of why they've been kept out. Um, 
Is there any more wine now we can start drinking? They, they left over some. Oh, great. Uh, okay. so. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Eric, my son has something to say. Oh. Eric, what? no, no, you got to wait for my son. Just, just oh. on, a, on another broader note that, I mean, there's a similar theme that we've seen with the Marriott Hotel Group and Marriott Hotel Group 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 I forget where that museum, there's a, that museum. Where, that's but, and in Montgomery. Montgomery, and he's in that Alabama, the person running that museum. The Lynch Museum, to, yeah. To, uh, so that's Brian Stevenson. But then I started thinking as you were talking, okay, we've got the controversy about the Confederate monuments. What have those meant since they were erected like 1911 to people, and if we bring them down, what does that mean? Th th that is a part of what we're interested in. It's what is the, the, the people experience? Yes. You, you can talk about the aesthetic uh, message, you can talk about the, the, um, the linguistic message, but what is that in relation to the experiential? There, there's one other thing that comes to mind with your question. Um, not far from the zoo in, in Berlin, there was an old building, and there was a wall. Uh, and on that wall was Gothic writing. And it, it, it was very strange. You know, it was, it was, any of you know, have you seen Gothic writing? Um, I wish I had a photograph of it. It's German uh, print. Ger it's German print. Yeah, yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that affected me by looking at it because I know that that was a place that existed prior to liberation and so on, that existed when Hitler came to power. By the way, I had nothing to do with Hitler's coming to power. We were both poor. He became chancellor the year I was born. Now you figure that one out yourself while I drink a glass of wine. The day you were born. Huh? The day I was born. Wow. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.